Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to the lecture this evening. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, from me about our future lecture program. Um, on uh, the 25th of June is our next event. We've got Professor David Ormer from the Law Commission coming to talk about the new sentencing code. Indeed, we're hoping that um, that will even constitute a launch event for the, the new sentencing code, so we encourage people to come to that. Uh, on the 15th of October, <coughs> we'll have a lecture from Professor Alison Young, newly appointed as the Sir David Williams Professor of Public Law at Cambridge. And uh, date for your diaries, uh, 19th of November will be our annual Lord Renton lecture, which this year will be given by um, Baroness Hale of Richmond, the new president of the Supreme Court. So I hope you'll agree that we uh, continue to maintain standards with our lecture programme, which brings me to this evening. We're very uh, grateful indeed to um, Professor Tom Poole from the LSE uh, for agreeing to uh, give a lecture for the Society this evening. Tom studied uh, law at UCL, Oxford and Manchester University. He started teaching at the LSE where he is a professor in 2006. He works mainly in the field of public law and constitutional theory. And I have to say, I've always found his writing extremely interesting and incisive, if I may say so. His latest book, which is sitting prominently <laughs> on the table, uh, though unopened and unread by anyone, uh, is entitled Reason of State, Law, Prerogative and Empire. He wrote a major article in 2016 on the Constitution and foreign affairs. So he's very well placed to speak to us on his topic for this evening, which is the case for the federative, a foreign relations power for the age of statutes. So I hand the uh, uh, floor, if that's the right word, over to Tom for this evening. Thank you uh, very much for those kind words, and, and thank you so much. I really do appreciate you coming on WhatsApp. A horribly cold, cold evening, so thank you very much. Now, a constitution to adapt, David Hume, can be understood as an institutional and normative arrangement that reflects the balance of political community and struck between authority and liberty. Uh, but this balance is not purely the product of internal endogenous growth. Constitutions face outwards as well as inwards, and these two faces are related, at least insofar as the extent to which a constitution engages with the world outside it feeds back into the way it constructs itself internally. Now, I all but stumbled on this idea, which I call the double-facing constitution, when researching a book on law and empire a few years ago, Hume um, uh, <coughs> Prof. Uh, part of the motivation for that book was to excavate constitutional discourse surrounding empire, sourced from cases involving monopoly trading companies, especially the East India Company, which, as the book took shape, uh, became a character uh, of a sort in its own right as the book progressed, um, as well as legal treatises and the theoretical writings of uh, people like Hobbes and Harrington, Smith and Burke, Bentham and J.S. Mill. And the more I, I delved into that body of work, the more the canon of British constitutional writings began to realign itself, or, or so it felt at least. Uh, the temptation nowadays to think and write as though empire never happened is strong. Now, it's not my purpose to explore the socio-psychological conditions or dimensions of the process uh, of distancing, merely to note one of its consequences. Um, I think it makes things much simpler, both intellectually and morally, to proceed on the basis of the imperial entanglements and complications that form so important part of our history, have left no real or lasting impression on our understanding of constitutional order, its structures and uh, principles. When it comes to the Constitution, though, ours is not an island story, or at least not only that. Looking back, it's easy to see how often familiar doctrines uh, and principles emerge out of the intestine struggle, to quote Hume again, of power and right, imperium and potestas. <coughs> I don't mean to give that process uh, too whiggish a gloss. It's a messy story with many strands and subplots and change with the outcome of aversion, chance, and compromise as much as aspirational principle. So much is to be expected out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made and all that. But I might hazard the following generalizations about this historical story. First, that there's no significant public law concept that has not been at least partially hammered out on the anvil of empire. 
Second, that no serious jurist writing in the period, say from Calvin's case to Burma Oil, failed to consider the question of the constitution of the state without also considering the construction of the empire. These jurists were often troubled by what we might call, after Burke, a geographical constitution morality among Britain's patchwork empire. But what runs like a leitmotif through their work is the potential for external constitutional action to feed back into the internal constitutional order, ultimately tainting the latter. The fear that obsessed our juristic forebears was, to put it more cute, crudely than they would have, that the bad stuff that goes on in our name abroad might come back to haunt the domestic constitution. Nois orbis victus vos vicit, as the influential Tacitian thinker Justus Lipsius said uh, in uh, 1603. The new world, conquered by you, has conquered you in its turn. So far, I've been talking largely about the past, but our focus this evening is on the foreign affairs power today. However, I intend to use this idea of the double-facing constitution as something of a lens through which to consider the relevant parts or parts of our constitutional order. Now, to get somewhere, you need to start somewhere. Um, and Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, as often as not, performs for me both the role of point of origin and also sparring partner. And tonight's no exception. I start by describing or mapping two divergent models. The first, which I call the sovereignty model and source in Hobbes, sees the foreign affairs power essentially as an attribute of the state's sovereign capacity to wage war. The other, which I call after Locke, the federative model, constructs the same power principally in terms of a constitutional capacity to engage juridically with other states. I go on to argue that there are good reasons for preferring the federative model, not least on account of its better fit with constitutional principle. So let's begin by setting out the sovereignty model. I put it first because, besides from my penchant for things Hobbesian, I suspect that it predominated among at least 20th century public lawyers, partly on account of its kinship with Anglophone legal positivism. The model in bare outline postulates a sharp separation between inside and outside. The former, marked by the presence of law, is the domain of peace. The latter, marked by law's necessary absence, exists in a state of nature and is, as such, the terrain of war. We bring in Hobbes here to put a little flesh on those very bare bones. Now, you may well be familiar with the image in the frontispiece of the first division of Leviathan from 1651, designed by uh, Abraham Boss, or Bosser, in close collaboration with the author. In it, the Commonwealth, under the aegis of a Leviathan figure at once benevolent and terrible, is imagined as an island at peace with itself. Cultivated rolling hills enfold <coughs> an orderly and quietly industrious townscape. The sun shines on the land, this artificial Eden. But out to sea, beyond what we might think today of as the Commonwealth's territorial waters, things are the opposite of calm. It's murky out there, but as far as we can make out, all is storm-tossed waves and turbulent skies, connoting not just political bad weather, but something more elemental, perhaps political uncontrollability, in other words, anarchy. But while storm clouds gather abroad at home, they're kept at bay by the power of that mortal god, Leviathan. But what about the text itself? There's actually very little of note in Leviathan elsewhere in Hobbes' output on the Commonwealth's external relations, oddly enough. What we can deduce can be distilled into the following propositions. First, that the law of nations is the same as the law of nature. In other words, a set of principles derivable from reason whose ultimate goal is to secure peaceful coexistence. Second, that the condition of states among themselves is at least the functional equivalent of the condition of man in the state of nature. And third, that being so, states interact within a condition of war, which Hobbes defines not by the actual act of fighting, but by an ever readiness or preparedness to fight. This outlook is captured in char characteristically visceral script right at the start of the earlier monograph, The Kiwi, where Hobbes writes, man is a god to man and man is a wolf to man. The former is true of the relations of citizens with each other, the latter of relations between commonwealths. Brought back into the commonwealth, this produces what one is tempted to call a passive aggressive conception of the foreign relations power. To quote Hobbes here from Leviathan, a famous passage this, in all times kings and persons of sovereign authority because of their independency are in continual jealousies 
and in the state and posture of gladiators, having their weapons pointing and their eyes fixed on one another, that is, their forts, garrisons and guns upon the frontiers of their kingdoms, and continual spies upon their neighbours, which is the posture of war. I find it helpful to think of Hobbes as responding to the early modern problem of raison d'etat, reason of state, thinking. Uh, most closely associated with the, the politics and policies of Cardinal Richelieu's France, and before that, the murderously Machiavellian princely city-states of Italy. Understood as government essentially in the private interest of the prince, Hobbes thought, as many of his contemporaries did, of course, that such political structures were unstable and corrupt, domestically on account of the vast arbitrary power vested in the regime, and externally due to their aggressive and destabilising action driven by the prince's urge to swagger and glory hunt. Hobbes' answer to the problem was essentially to keep the sovereignty but ditched the sovereign. You do this by replacing the him, the prince, with an it, that is law. The person of the prince becomes the artificial man of the commonwealth. In internal affairs, this equates to a structure in which overwhelming power props up the state's capacity to operate a legal regime and so produce peace, order and good government. In external matters, it means that the sovereign gets to use the military and intelligence material at its disposal to navigate an essentially a legal framework geared to war and so produce external peace, that is, protect the Commonwealth from external threat. The problem with this is that it affects only a very partial escape from reason of state. Hobbes' theory doesn't escape the reason of state paradigm in foreign relations, and it doesn't really even try to. The danger to the stability of the Commonwealth of allowing its political leadership to operate a discretionary, secretive and aggressive foreign policy, gladiators, spies and so on, uh, I think is self-evident. One wonders quite what the point is of rescuing the Commonwealth from arbitrary power within the realm, only to allow it to re-enter via the back door as a consequence of its external actions. But what if the Commonwealth stays in defensive mode? It's a virtue of Hobbes' theory, after all, that it remains pretty consistently anti-imperial. Even if such a posture could be maintained, but one wonders how, the Commonwealth becomes a little bit like a lobster in a lobster pot. Sovereign in its own domain, perhaps, but since the environment in which it operates cannot be legally patterned, although excesses might perhaps be politically contained, it's disabled from making its subjects' lives more secure and more rewarding over the long term. Let's turn now to the federative model, which I all but rescue from its progenitor, John Locke. In the second treatise, Locke offered a, a constitutionalist solution to the reason of state problem. How do we have structures of authority without being dominated? His solution relied on a thicker account of the rule of law than Hobbes's version, and legal limits on sovereign capacity, limits reinforced ultimately by a right to rebellion. Above all, perhaps, it rested on the institutional separation or fragmentation of power an idea anathema to Hobbes, but familiar from Republican <coughs> thinkers of the period. The Federative appears, only a very brief appearance it must be said, in the part of the Second Treatise in which these institutional arrangements are discussed. The Legislative is supreme, of course, among constituted powers, Locke tells us, although ultimate sovereignty always rests with the people. Executive power he divides into three. Ordinary executive power, now these are my terms by the way, which exists principally to ensure that the laws, uh, it, that the laws the legislative passes are given constant and lasting force. Special executive power, discussed in a later chapter under the label prerogative, uh, is the well of reserve power that exists outside and against the laws which the leadership may draw upon at its discretion for the public good. But Locke also identifies a third <coughs> power, this power, he says, may be called the federative, if one pleases, a little diffident. Though distinct, Locke considers the executive and the federative to be intimately related. The former comprehends, he writes, the executive of the municipal laws of the society within itself, while the latter covers, I quote, the management of the security and interest of the public without. Partly for that reason, he continues, the powers are almost always united, two jurisdictions in effect of the same office. Locke offers two overlapping reasons for this arrangement. The Federative First is much less capable, he writes, to be directed by antecedent standing positive laws than the Executive. And so, too, it must, be, it must be left to the prudence and wisdom of those whose hands it is in to be managed for the public good. 
I think Locke is basically right to isolate a special capacity within the Commonwealth to act to the best of its ability in its interactions with other political communities to secure the Commonwealth's interests. So far, though, I've been rather imprecise when talking about what we might call the state's external capacity. Because most of the relevant actions occurs within the Commonwealth's own institutions and pathways. This is so even if, in some cases, the Commonwealth's agents, or some of them, diplomats, for instance, or soldiers, armed forces, are operating in a territory that is not under the Commonwealth's control. It's the Commonwealth that remains the relevant agent, that decides whether and how to act. And the acts of even those ter extraterritorial agents are ascribed to it. What is distinctive about this form of state power, then, is not so much where it is exercised, but that it implicates a political logic that differs in significant ways from the standard model whereby the conduct of agents takes place within a regime of settled state law, <coughs> in Hobbes' phrase. This is due, of course, to the basic features of the international landscape that condition the exercise of this external capacity. The objective here is different, less about using the collective strength of the Commonwealth to prescribe rules of justice, than about using that strength to secure the interests of the collective. And the vertical structure of authority that makes the standard model possible is also absent, of course, in this external sphere. Here, the primary agents, a plurality of commonwealths, horizontally ordered in as much as they are ordered, over which no one of them has superior jurisdiction. But Locke does more than specify a constitutional space in which the external capacity operates. He chooses not to define that space, as Hobbes had done, in terms of the primordial question of war. The central case of the Federative is not for Locke the decision to declare war, but the capacity to make binding agreements. After all, the term Federative itself comes from the Latin foidus, foidera meaning agreement or pact, agreements or pacts. <coughs> By making it a constitutive element of foreign relations, Locke suggests that the paradigmatic feature of this dimension of state power is the ability to conclude more or less formal alliances with other commonwealths. Now, an important consequence of demarcating this part of the Constitution as a federative power in that sense is that it allows us not only to identify a set of properties that are a necessary feature of the Commonwealth, it also isolates certain basic features of what we, we might call the federative, federative terrain. That is, the international, or less anachronistically perhaps, interstate, political come juridical space produced by the interaction between a plurality of Commonwealths exercising their respective federative capacities. The primary feature of the federative terrain, the possibility of affecting agreements between states, relies on the proposition that such agreements can at least plausibly result in action consistent with the terms of those agreements among the states which are party to them. This proposition in turn presupposes two basic conditions, what we might call statecraft or strategy and legal agency or law. Now, Locke himself explicitly acknowledges the first of these elements. The federative, he says, corresponds to a domain of strategic action characterized by the interplay of, I quote, the variation of designs of interests of states. By contrast, Locke seems reluctant to give much legal color to the federative terrain. Also, at first, it would seem. Locke, follow, Locke seems to follow Hobbes in saying that each state finds itself in a similar predicament in relation to other states as the individual does to other individuals in the state of nature. But Locke's natural condition is not the wasteland described with such relish in Leviathan. Lockean natural law is considerably thicker and certainly recognizes a capacity to make binding promises. By analogy, the long-term operation of these natural law capacities should correspond in the international state of nature to an environment capable of sustaining a relatively stable, though imperfect, order produced and populated by state agents who can effectively bind themselves to one another through the exchange of promises. So the federative presupposes that the international state of nature is capable of sustaining an environment in which binding agreements, treaties, can be effected between agents, states. Now, even these spare normative foundations allow for the possibility of more complex forms of interstate lawmaking. I think one interesting way of reading Locke's general story, its general account of the move from the natural to the civil condition is a story about the progress of law. That story itself has two threads. First, a more straightforward narrative about the development of how we came to rely on law in the first place. And second, 
an account of the genesis of the normative and cultural attitudinal structures necessary to sustain law. Applying this reading to the federative, we can suggest that the state has a duty to do what it can to foster the developing framework of legality, both within and outside its borders, and in respect of both its external and internal constitutional capacities. This interpretation itself affects a shift in the core meaning of the federative. Properly understood, what appeared first to be a preeminently strategic capacity operating within a legally inchoate sphere becomes that bit of the domestic constitutional architecture for which the state's rights and duties in respect of the law generating aspects of international law are exercised. A little bit like the airlock of a ship, the federative performs a vital role in connecting the legal order of the state with the external legal order of the international realm. Let's take stock. Locke was onto something, in my view. He was right to consider the external dimension of state activity as a particular power with its own highly distinctive characteristics. And his intuition that at the heart of that power lay a capacity to enter legal relations with other states was also right. <coughs> This characterization opens the possibility of enabling the rule of law framework of the domestic constitution to reach outside the state and feed back into it indeed. The idea of the federative terrain in particular gives us a way from the perspective of domestic public law of making sense of the interconnectedness of the inside and the outside of constitutional orders. Where Locke fell short though was in not building on these insights in light of his constitutionalist theory specifically underestimated the juridical component of what he took to be a power that combined law and strategy. We've already seen that point. But he also failed to square the federative power against his theory of divided power. The institutional pairing of executive and federative may have seemed natural to Locke, but at least when put so starkly, it's not. If you want to guard your constitution against arbitrary rule, then you need institutional protections against open-ended discretion vested in the political leadership wherever it arises. The US Constitution, for instance, in many ways a practical instantiation of the Lockean archetype, parcels out foreign relations power to both the executive and legislative branches, grants some power, like command of the military exclusively to the president, others, like the regulation of foreign co commerce, and the power to declare war to Congress, which also, of course, has oversight powers, while still others it divides among the two or simply doesn't assign. But where does our Constitution now lie. I think it would be far too reductionist to claim that the Constitution is Lockean in any straightforward sense. But I do think that in its construction of the foreign relations power, the Constitution is now more fundamentally and consistently federative in orientation than sovereignist. That this is overlooked by some public law scholars I put down to two things. First, an ongoing, at least relative blindness to this part of the Constitution. And second, a tendency to think about this part of the Constitution as largely the domain of prerogative and common law. Now, it's usually a mistake in the British Constitution and its analysis to overlook what Parliament does, but in this field, to do so is unforgivable. There's been much discussion of uh, constitutional statutes since Mr Justice Laws, as he then was, first mooted the term in the Thoburn case. But what few seem to have noticed is that most of the post-1945 statutes, most would agree, fall within this category. So, of course, the European Communities Act and the Human Rights Act, but I'd also add the United Nations Act of 1946. All these statutes are federative statutes. That is, they simultaneously engage with external streams of legal authority, the EU, the ECHR and the UN, respectively, and bring the UK into line by authoritatively adjusting the internal legal regime. But I go further. They're not just federative statutes, or at least reinforce the federative idea, but they also show Parliament in a federative capacity. Where Locke should have gone on the institutional front, I suggest, is to make the legislative the key mediator of the Jus Imperium and the Jus Civile as part of its role as guardian of the Constitution, and statute the central expression of this mediating function. This is more than just a matter of legal form, important though that is in this context can also be a matter of substance. Take the UN Act, which I just men mentioned. For the UK Parliament to pass it not only gave new statutory powers to government ministers, statutory powers are always subject to legal limits, thereby further limiting the scope of prerogative in this field, 
but it also, more importantly, gave domestic support and therefore concrete meaning, specification, to the new rules of the international legal order, the key plank of which is the prohibition on the use of force against another state except where the Security Council have authorised it to maintain or restore international peace of security, except where a state is exercising uh, its inherent right of self-defence as recognised by the UN Charter, Article 51. Now, Ahmed and the Treasury, a case from 2010 uh, before the Supreme Court, illustrates this rather well. The case concerned, as many of you know, the asset freezing powers against those suspected of complicity with terrorism introduced in the UK as elsewhere to conform with various UN Security Council resolutions. The, Security, the, sorry, the Supreme Court found that the UN Act did not provide the requisite authority to pass the challenged orders. The problem with the orders was that they con contained drastic and oppressive powers, in Lord Hope's words, that had lain entirely outside parliamentary scrutiny. Applying the familiar principle of legality, the idea that Parliament must squarely confront what it's doing and accept the political cost, the court did not think that the, 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 uh, the, the act enabled this coercive power. Uh, the, uh, sorry, sorry. The, the, the courts did not think that the, the, uh, the co coercive power could be imputed to the 1946 Parliament. Now, it's not just constitutional statutes like the UN Act, of course. Dozens, perhaps more, of other statutes have, have done something similar in relation to more specific parts of international or regional law. Their net effect has been to internalise the post-1945 world order into our constitutional structures. This in turn has influenced other parliamentary developments. The Ponsonby Rule, for instance, the constitutional convention that required <coughs> most international treaties to be laid before Parliament 21 days before ratification was put on a statutory footing in 2010. A War Powers Convention is emerging, which seems to recognise a right for the House of Commons to debate and vote on a government proposal to deploy armed force overseas outside the emergency context, uh, a convention uh, seemingly recognised in the cabinet manual back in 2011. Courts operate in this milieu. That is one <coughs> dominated internally by statute and externally by an intricate, dynamic and increasingly functional matrix of law. As such, their responsibility for upholding the rule of law necessarily entails certain duties in relation to this federative zone, among which I'd here emphasise the following. First, the policing of the constitutional allocation of functions. In this context, so often, this is often preeminently a matter of preserving Parliament's legislative or oversight capacity. Second, a vital role in protecting rights, by which I don't mean solely or even necessarily mainly human rights. A key dimension of which here is the denial of differential standards at home and abroad. Third, a duty common to all state institutions, I think, to seek consonance where possible between domestic and non-domestic sources of legal authority. And fourth, by virtue of their discursive reason-giving practices, courts have a particularly interesting narrative role in order to make sense of ongoing <coughs> developments, juridical developments in this area. It's hard to imagine on this score a better account of the early 21st century feder federative than that provided by Lord Mans in one of the active state cases handed down by the Supreme Court in January of last year. First, rejecting the sovereignty model idea on the ground that it equates sovereignty with executive capacity, his words. Mans continued, in states subject to the rule of law, a state's sovereignty may be manifest through its legislative, executive or judicial branches acting within their respective spheres. A rule of recognition which treats any executive act by the government of a foreign state as valid, irrespective of its legality under the law of the foreign state could mean ignoring rather than giving effect to the way in which a state's sovereignty is expressed. Lord Mance's observations here remind us that the operation of the federative is not just about how we respond internally to external legal stimuli. It's also about how our own juridical actions relate to the juridical actions of other states. We call that idea of the federative terrain. The distinguished international jurist and judge, indeed, James Crawford, has said that it is not too much to say that in many of these areas, the role of international law is to reinforce and on occasions to institute the rule of law internally. Extending his point, might we not say this, that the role of the federative is also to reinforce and on occasions to institute 
the rule of law externally. Thank you.